big round of applause for Michelle. Is that working now? Whoa, okay. It is working. Is it working? Yes? All right. Hello, Perth. Thank you for having me. This is fantastic. I am from Melbourne, and before I flew in here, I um, yesterday morning went to see a talk by Brene Brown. If you don't know who Brene Brown is, she has her own Netflix special, for example. And if you have even the tiniest bit of imposter syndrome, I suggest you don't watch one of the top TED speakers the day before you're going to do your own talk. <laughs> the other thing that fills me with uh, joy and confidence, um, there is another talk by Michelle Sanford about robots. And in my original intro, I was practicing on my husband. And I said, if, you, if you're in the, looking for the Michelle talk about the robots taking over the world, you're in the wrong room. And he got up off the couch and went, where are the robots? <laughs> I was like, thanks, honey. This is great. So thank you all for coming to my talk. Um, I am going to talk about what to do when you're working on Agile. Who is working on Agile? I assume everybody, because nobody admits to doing anything else anymore. It's like, <laughs> I'm Agile. Yeah, me too. We're, we're really Agile. Yeah, <laughs> us too. Um, so it's what to do when you're working on Agile projects and your manager says, as mine did once, you know, oh, when will it be done yet? And is it done yet? And how about now? And then it kind of goes in this cycle. When will it be done? Is it done yet? How about now? When will it be done? Um, which turns into a little bit of a death spiral. And as promised, I do have a magic crystal ball, which I used. Uh, but first of all, I would like to thank all of these awesome sponsors, because they help make this conference affordable for all of us. Um, shameless plug for Yao, because uh, <laughs> We are also an awesome conference, uh, giving away free tickets, last chance to enter, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I would also like to thank the volunteers because you have put in so much work. I have seen, I know how running a conference is, and you absolutely blow me away. So thank you, all the volunteers, for this conference, because you guys are great. It's very exciting for me. I was here as a, as a kind of a hoverer last year, so it's exciting that I get to speak. So once upon a time, uh, when Agile and I were both much younger. I worked on a team, as you do, and um, we were working supposedly Agile, as, as tends to happen. And despite the fact that we were supposedly Agile, we still had these wretched deadlines. And you know, we'd be working weekends and, and nights, and it was just a god-awful mess. And at the same time, I was reading about you know, Agile, sustainable pace, and I'm thinking, you know what? Real agile workplaces don't have deadlines. We're just doing this wrong. This is rubbish. If only I was at one of those real agile places, that would be fantastic. Um, and then I left that company and I went to work at a real agile place, um, which made products and was really product centric and was everything I'd even read about. And um, yeah, we still had deadlines. And I thought, all right, okay, what's, what's going on here? What's up with this? And the thing is, in our case, I was working at zero, um, and we had government legislation. You know, guess what? The ATO is not going to move the end of the tax year for you because <laughs> your project's a little bit late. So a couple of the things I was working on was um, making tax digital, which is a project in the UK, uh, HMRC, which is their equivalent of the ATO. Um, we were working on a project for that, implementing that at zero, and also Simpler Bass, which was another ATO project. Um, but hey, you know, maybe there's another kind of deadline. Uh, again, Australian Open date, they're not going to shift it just because your website's not ready. So, um, you know, or maybe your company and, and another company are kind of in a little bit of a race to put something out first. Um, you know, zero, MYOB, one of them puts something out, the other one's like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll get there first. Um, so that might be a reason you're trying to put thing, something up um, before a, a certain date. Um, people, another date that's not going to shift. No one's going to move their birth delivery date of their child because they have a thing that they need to work on. So you might need to you know, adhere to that deadline. Uh, another example might be you've, you've made this wonderful proclamation. So again, at Zero, they have these enormous conferences called ZeroCon where somebody stands up and says, we are going to deliver this amazing thing by the first quarter. And you really want to actually be able to do that because if you don't, um, you kind of end up with something like this. So this is a site called 
Elon Musk today, and it's entirely devoted to tracking all the promises Mr. Musk has made on Twitter and how he's kind of tracking to that. Um, you know, spoiler alert, generally not so good. So, you know, I mean, this is, this is a bit of a joke, right? This is slightly exaggerated, but I, I found hell hath no fury like a customer scorned. So you really, uh, you really don't want to do that. So where did this impression come from? If you tweeted the first one to show that I'm a moron, you can tweet this one now and say, yeah, no, I, I don't think that's really the case. That's kind of what I thought. Uh, it's not in the Agile Manifesto. They do talk about sustainable pace, but they don't say we value not having deadlines, right? So I'm thinking there's probably a couple of reasons why younger, more naive me had this impression. And the first one is a lot of times we talk about companies that are doing it right or doing it good. Has anybody heard of the Spotify model? <laughs> you know, Spotify, Facebook, Google, um, Twitter, Netflix, you know, these are all companies that are held up as being, these are the great places to work, right? But I don't know about you, and maybe I missed the memo, but I don't ever hear Facebook saying, we're bringing you this awesome new feature next Thursday. You're just logging in and it's like, Duh, what just happened? Google sometimes gives you the ability to swap in or out. Um, Google Calendar, I'm looking at you, uh, they brought out the new version of Calendar and they still let you go back to the old one, which was just as well because all the stuff that was in the old one wasn't really in the new one yet when they first brought it out. So you kind of had to go back to the old one. YouTube still has some of that. But sometimes you just get what you get and you can't swap back and then you get things like this. So probably most people know Ming. Um, I was in the middle of writing this talk and Ming kindly put this on LinkedIn as an example of the sort of feeling that you have as a user when you're merrily using your product, in which case Facebook, and they make a small change. And um, she was a little bit displeased with that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the other thing that people associate with, with deadlines is, is this guy. I don't know if everybody's seen the movie Office Space. It's kind of required viewing for people in our industry. Um, and even the word deadline, people just have this, like, Bleh. as soon as you say deadline, you're like, oh, that's it, my life is over. So we end up calling things milestones and goals and things that are a little bit less horrifying because as soon as you say deadline, people just think this guy's going to show up and tell you that you're just going to go have to ask you to go ahead and come in Saturday and Sunday and there goes your weekend and your life and your sleep and as in the previous talk it's burnout city um, and, and you just hope that if only we did this agile thing properly all this horror would disappear um, another thing I saw on LinkedIn from Josh Partogi who's a, a scrum coach I think he's sometimes around Perth and somehow he ends up always putting something on social media around about the time I'm doing a talk so I He's, he's a feature of my talks for some reason. So he, he's got this manifesto for deadline-driven development. We're uncovering bitter ways of developing software by doing lots of overtime and you know, possibly forcing others to do it, right? But does it have to be like this? I mean, if, we, if we're taking it as a given that sometimes deadlines happen for reasons, uh, there must be some other way we can cope apart from turning into the guy telling you you have to come in and, and having these horrible manifestos. We want to avoid the death march and the, and the mini waterfall horror. So what I'm going to try and do in the next few minutes is to give you some ideas of things that we had tried and that kind of helped with this. Um, obviously, the answer is estimates. Because if only we did this right, then everything would be fine. You know, come on. We just need to get better at estimating. Has anybody ever heard anybody say this? <laughs> and the first time I heard that, I thought, wow, OK, you know, we could spend a whole lot of time improving anything. And really, this is what you want to spend the time and effort on? Um, you know, to a lot of people, when you say estimate, where there's an estimate, there's an actual. And then if I'm a manager, I get to compare them. And then I get to say, well, oh, you're, you're really not very good at estimating, because look at the difference between your estimates and your actuals. Do better. But you know, is, is really, is that what we want to spend our time on? I question this. 
So in, there's a book called Lean Software Development, which maybe some people have heard of. Uh, it was written by the Poppendicks, Mary and Tom Poppendick, and this is what they have to say about waste. So it's anything that doesn't add value to a product. And the value is determined by the customer. So I don't know about you as customers. I know certainly when I get a product, I don't go, well, you know, it's all right, but I wish they'd done a better job of estimating. I mean, customers can't see that stuff. So if I look at this definition, time spent estimating is by definition a waste, right? And it should be minimized with the goal of trying to eliminate it rather than spending time getting better because if you're spending time on it, to try and improve, that kind of increases the waste. So I'm not going to say, hashtag no estimates. Don't ever do that. It summons trolls if you do that on social media. I am not joking. There's a group of people in Melbourne. We were setting up Agile drinks. And it was like, what time do you think you're going to be there? And their comment was, I'm not really sure. Hashtag no estimates. Ha ha. Boom. Here comes the guy. <laughs> well, you're not. Blah, blah, blah. And I thought, he's trolling a pub conversation. Wow, these people are intense. So don't say that. What I will say is to try and spend less time on estimating, not more. OK, fine. I hear you say that sounds good. But we still need a way to know when will it be done. And are you done yet? So all right, alternatives, please. Um, what we want to try and do is to make our work as simple, transparent, and predictable as possible. OK, sounds logical. So predictable. This is a quote from Neil Killick, and he says that predictability is improved by behaving and delivering more predictably, not by getting better at making predictions. Right? So probably people have heard this kind of thing before. We want to try and put something valuable into the hands of users early on, get some feedback, and try and do it on a regular basis. You know, hello Scrum. Um, probably a lot of people have seen this drawing before as well. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's from Henrik Nyberg, and I'm going to relate it to deadlines. So if you're assuming that what you're trying to do is get somewhere faster than walking, right? I can quickly give you a skateboard and say, here you go, this will get you somewhere faster than walking. And as a customer, you might go, well, meh, kind of like the wheels, but it's a bit wobbly. And to be honest, it's not really that much less effort than it was when I was walking, a little bit faster. So then you can say, all right, here's a scooter, and so forth and so on. Now what the person or your customer might have been thinking of is what I really want is a car. Okay, But imagine if you're trucking along and you hit a deadline kind of here. Now if, if I was going straight for the car, when I get to that point, you know, and it's say ATO end date or whatever you have to ship, um, if I'm going straight for the car, I've got two wheels and some sort of axle, which is not very helpful. If I'm going with the bottom one, at least I have a bike. So I would say the bottom one is going to work better when you're, when you're faced with a deadline. Okay? So you're trying to have something useful along the way rather than going straight for the gold standard, which also sounds good in theory. It's a lovely picture. But how do you actually do this kind of thing? So my first recommendation is story mapping. Have, has everybody heard of story mapping before, or a few people? Um, there's a book by Jeff Patton called User Story Mapping, which I didn't bother with for a, quite a long time because I thought, that doesn't sound very interesting. So I will try and resell it to you as everything you ever wanted to know about doing anything with stories or developing ever, uh, because there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that's really, really helpful. So the idea of a story map is, as, as it sort of sounds, it's a, it's a map of a story. So you start from one side over here, and it's what users will do with your system or your product going across. And it's written in plain English words, no kind of techno jargon. Across the top is uh, the major activities that can be broken down, and underneath each one is what it can be broken down into. So the example that Jeff uses in the book is if I'm doing a map of getting ready to go to work in the morning. And this is a great exercise, a typical kind of workshop thing you can do when you're practicing this. One of the things across the top might be, I'm getting cleaned up. And that might break down into these short verb phrases, things like, have a shower, do my hair, shave, 
put on makeup. You know, another one might be get dressed, and you might go through all the different garments and different things. People, different people will do different things, but it's something that's quite easy to understand and easy to explain to somebody what it's, how it works. So, if we're looking at something that's simple, it's a pretty simple concept. It's like so many things that are simple, doesn't mean it's easy. Um, and if you put this thing up on a wall, like you can see here, it's also pretty transparent, right? Anybody can walk past it, like, what are you working on? It's like, ah, here's this thing I prepared earlier. And it's quite easy to explain to them what you're doing and how it relates to a customer. So that's another part of this. It's, it's very customer focused um, when you build this and as you iterate through it. So breaking it down when you have your map laid out, so if you've got your big story at the top, and then you've got your smaller stories lined up underneath, you can literally draw a line underneath a part of it that relates to a goal that can be completed. And I don't, it, it may or may not be an actual release, depending on how you term the word release, because people are like, oh, we do CD, we do 200 releases a day. Okay, that's fine. Um, but it's really a thing you can give a customer to get some feedback, right? So how, how Jeff, so th this is something I flogged from Jeff Patton, I didn't draw this, it's actually in his book and on his website. Uh, the first thing you wanna do is the good enough, so that might be your skateboard, and then you get some feedback and then you make it better, and so forth and so on, until you get to the really best thing that you can do. Um, this is a example doctrinated because I went through all my photos and went, I wonder if I have a real picture of something we actually did. So the interesting thing here is that it coincidentally fairly well resembles the previous thing. So this was for making tax digital. We had a compliance goal that we had to had to had to meet by a certain date. So that was our very minimum MVP. What we ended up doing was in some cases removing some of the bells and whistles that had been in previous uh, UK tax fulfillment to really focus on that goal. And then we started adding things back in and making it more and more whiz bang. Um, so by the time we got to the bottom part, it was the bells and whistles all singing or dancing. But if, if, our, if our deadline came and all we'd done was the compliance goal, we were fine. We could ship that and we would know that we'd at least met the bare minimum for compliance. Um, so this is a pretty high level thing because our board wasn't that big. Um, but yeah, you can see that we sort of followed that pretty well, so that was good. Um, who uses JIRA? Pretty much, yeah, lots of people use Jira. Okay, again, not being paid for this, but there is a third party add-on with the really snappy name of Easy Agile Story Map for Jira. Um, I don't know, is anybody using this? If, if you're doing story mapping and you're using Jira, it is not a free thing, you will have to pay for it, but it's a really, really good idea. Because what we found was, when we started with the big wall and put everything on there, because we were using Jira for the day to day, we could mimic that giant wall in Jira and then it was so much easier to follow along and keep things going and our slices could then become related to releases in Jira and we could do sprints within that and it just, it was, it was really good. I was surprised, um, yeah. So also great for people that work remotely because you know, I don't know if you've ever tried to do a remote meeting where you're trying to hold up somebody's machine so they can see the physical board. Like, yeah, you can't read what's on the card, but it's up there somewhere. Um, this is much, much better. So if you are using Jira, plus one for this thing. Okay, so now we've got our map, thinking about story points. So I don't know how many of you all have ever been in a, in a planning meeting where you've spent ooh, way too much time trying to decide if a story is a three or a five and people will be having their heated argument while everybody else is going. Um, maybe this only happened to me, I don't know. But again, why, 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 why are you doing that? And even worse, that whole thing where people go, okay, so that, yeah, that'll take me a week, so yeah, that's a five. And, and then you get to the other end where somebody's going, okay, so that's a nine, so that's what, that'll take you two weeks? I'm like, why are you doing that? Why would you take time to put it into story points to then put it back into time? Just why, 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 why? And I mean, this is, the numbers there, just wow, why? So, uh, you know, I, I sort of questioned this and it felt 
a bit like heresy, because we all know that if you're agile, you have to have story points, right? You know? And then I saw this um, from Ron Jeffries, and he said, ah, one, two, and two big. Uh, days, not points. And I went, oh, yeah, that's cool. That's kind of what I think too. You know, this is how you can size stories. It takes one day, it takes two days, or it's too big, break it down. Um, if you don't know who Ron Jeffries is, um, he's the guy who invented story points. <laughs> <laughs> and he's been spending a lot of time apologizing for it since and for the misuse of story points because the idea was with the best of intentions. It was to stop people from being beaten by saying, you told me this would take two days and it took four, you know, how dare you? Um, so they thought, oh, I will fool you. It's, it's not in days, it's in points. But everybody just translates it. So I thought, okay, I'm, I'm in good company here if I'm questioning this. Um, so my suggestion of something to try is to break the work down into kind of stories of the same size as best as you can either using you know, that one, two, too big idea, or uh, Neil Killick's got another one where he says each story should fulfill one acceptance criterion. So if you're using acceptance criteria, try and make your stories the same size. And no, you'll never get them all exactly the same size, but the, the idea is to try and do that. And if you can do that, then you can start just counting how many you have instead of worrying about how big each one is. And then things get easier. And if you are using Jira, you can configure it to use story counts instead of story points or time. Ooh. So it's just another level of simplification. Uh, another thing that I suggest, everybody, everybody knows that we're agile, so we measure velocity. Um, OK, that's nice. But I think if you look at lean theory, the cycle time and throughput are actually a little bit more important. So if you haven't heard of these things before, the cycle time is how long it takes you to get from a certain point in your process to a certain other point. So in software development, it's usually from, you know, if you're doing the sort of board thing, you take it from the to-do pile and it's in progress all the way through until, you know, done, done, or released, or finished, or whatever you want to call the column on the end. And your throughput is how many, now that we're counting stories, I can count how many stories I did per iteration, so per sprint or per week or whatever you're doing. Um, I had teams that were doing Kanban that did by week or sprint, we did two weeks. Um, yeah, so if you're kind of looking at the idea of these two things instead of velocity, um, the shorter cycle times are likely to have higher throughput. And supposedly, according to the theory of constraints, the best way to optimize is to focus on your throughput. Um, so the idea is to try and get this predictability of pushing through the same number of stories per iteration. Again, if you're in Jira land, they call this the control chart. I don't know why, but that's what it's called. So if you're looking for cycle time, it's called control. I guess they want to feel like they're controlling. Um, but it's quite an easy visual because if, you're, uh, if your cycle time is roughly the same for each story, these little green dots will be closer together. And that shaded area will be thinner. So you can just look at this and go, whoa, they're really far apart. Our stories aren't really equally sized. If they're kind of close, you think, yeah, we're doing OK. Um, also, I would suggest that one week uh, to do per story might be a little bit big. So you might want to get it down to the one to two days thing. This is an example I just flogged off of the JIRA uh, website. Nothing to do with anything I've ever worked on. <clears throat> So, um, the next thing we can look at is forecasting. So once you've started to become more predictable, you can then think more about how your past performance can indicate future. So if you're in Brisbane and it's summertime, for example, uh, the chances yesterday was hot with a chance of rain. Today will be hot with a chance of rain. Tomorrow will also be hot with a chance of rain because it's quite Predictable. In Melbourne, on the other hand, yeah, God knows, you're on your own. Um, so bearing in mind, of course, this is a model. All models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, there's a number of different ways you can do this forecasting. So again, our friend Jira has a burn down thing, which will tell you, again, this is something I just took off the bog standard Atlassian website. Uh, based on your velocity for the last three sprints, it will take you six more to complete this epic. Yay, that's pretty good. Not bad. But we can do better. 
So probabilistic forecasting is the reason why if you, if you look at your weather app, it doesn't tell you tomorrow it will rain. It tells you 60% chance of rain tomorrow. So it's, it's working something out based on probability. In a forecasting software world, this is the idea of what is the chance of finishing on or before a certain date. So how it works is you look at what percentage of the possible results were actually on or before that date, and then you can say, oh, we're 85% sure we can deliver by the 17th of August. So maths. Um, the other good thing is that probabilistic forecasting relies upon the inputs to these sort of maths things being inexact, which is great because that's what we have. And now, here it is, the magic crystal ball. So using Arthur C. Clarke's third law of any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, here is my crystal ball. This link takes you to a GitHub repository that was put out there by Troy McGuinness, who is forever, I am forever thankful, um, because he's got a bunch of spreadsheets that do all the maths for you, which is awesome. And the one I used as my magical prognosticator is called the Throughput Forecaster. And what that is, is an Excel spreadsheet um, that does a whole bunch of things. Some of them are the same things that you can do in JIRA, which is good. If you don't have JIRA, you can use this. And if you do, you can be even lazier and not use it and take the numbers right out of JIRA. Um, and so how it worked is, and this is an example. So the sheet has a whole bunch of instructions in it that um, I, I didn't show because it's fine print. But basically, to show you how little the work is, put in a date, how many stories are remaining to be completed? So you can take it, and I like how it says guess. So one of the teams I was working with did a t-shirt size, small, medium, large, and so they balanced it out depending on how many stories they thought something would break down into. So a large at the low, might be, ah, oh, yeah, we might break this up into three stories. A medium might be, eh, that could be a two, a one, a small would be one, and for a high guess, we did five, three, one. Uh, or you could just put in a, a bit more of a guessy guess, and then there's a guess what your split rate is. So another team I worked with had, had that, where we started out going, we've got no idea, let's just say, every story we have is going to turn into two stories when we start looking at it a little bit more. And then we realized, oh, that was, that was way off. OK, we need to get down a little bit closer. So we ended up with, I think, every story breaking up into 1.25. Then you tell it how many weeks or what your cycle is. So this was a Kanban one, one week. Uh, if you were doing sprints, it'd be two weeks. And then if you have got your historical data, so how many stories you completed per iteration, if you have at least seven weeks worth of that, then that goes in a sheet as well, which is so boring, I'm not even gonna show you because it's literally a column with number of stories completed in each cell, going back um, historically. And if you do that, you have data. If you don't have that, like if you're just starting out with a new team, have a guess, here's your low guess, here's your high guess. That's all you need to do. And then, ooh, it produces this wonderful red, amber, green, delightful chart guaranteed to please managers everywhere. So what is this witchcraft? It's actually running a Monte Carlo simulator behind the scenes with no work on my part. Yes, using statistics and probability to help visualize the potential outcomes. So in this case, the simulator is forecasting how long it will take to complete the features that we've told it we have based on the data that I entered so strenuously in the previous screen. So using this information, it hypothetically completes the work 500 times and then shows you the likelihood of it finishing by date. And in the spreadsheet itself, it shows you all kinds of whiz-bang graphs about how it was doing that. And I went, that's nice. I don't really need to know how you came up with the numbers because this is awesome. And after we used it a few times and found out that it was actually a reasonably good indicator, people started to have a bit more trust in it uh, and it became my magical crystal ball prognosticator, which was so valuable for such little effort. Like, I just took some numbers that we already had in JIRA and entered them in a spreadsheet, and it did it all the maths for me. Um, so what we ended up doing was creating estimates for confidence as well as time. So 
So again, something Jeff Patton talks about is what's your bet level? Like, would you bet, would you bet your house that you're going to be finished? Would you bet your lunch? You know, how does that fit into this? Um, you know, and it's red, yellow, and green, which management love. <laughs> Okay, so this is Troy McGinnis. He's the person who set this up. And as he says, forecasting is about answering questions to a transparent degree of certainty with as little effort as possible. So he has made that effortless. So it's simple, transparent, and provides an indicator of our predictability. Thanks, Troy. You're awesome. Okay, so the TLDR. Deadlines happen. Try spending less time estimating, not more. Use story mapping, even in JIRA, to help break up and visualize your work. Try using story counts instead of story points, and just rule, just reduces the, the level of cognitive challenge you're dealing with, not code. Focus more on throughput and cycle time and less on velocity. And then try the throughput forecaster to estimate confidence as well as time. My disclaimer is that these are some of the things that we tried and they actually worked. Um, but everything's in context, so please don't do the whole Spotify model thing. I went to this conference and I was told I'm not agile unless I'm, I stopped using story points. Yep, no, don't have to do that. What my goal was in this talk is to give you a few ideas and maybe hopefully some things you haven't seen before that you can try with your teams. Um, please do inspect and adapt. And if you want to know more about how to manage your work in an agile way while still dealing with this, when will it be done yet? Is it done? Is it done? How about now? Uh, there are books and blog posts done by these people. Uh, Jeff Patton, Troy McGinnis, Ron Jeffries, Neil Killick, Mary and Tom Poppendick, Goiko Adzik and Joanna Rothman, and probably some more, but these were just the people whose work I used putting this talk together. Um, and, yep, done. <laughs> So I'm hoping I've still left some time for questions. Loads of time. Oh. Loads of time. But we can't do questions until my mic's been turned on. Is it done yet? <laughs> yeah. Because like a true pro, I think Anyone got a professional? Oh, here we go. You found the button. Let's go. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. That was awesome.